this thing focuses. I forgot to start recording. Does your, your webcam have this problem ever? Well, let's suppose that it focuses. So we're going to start with this basic question. What does f prime tell us about that? Obviously the slope, but what else? Well, if the derivative positive, then f of x is doing what? Increasing. Increasing. We had like a really complicated definition of increasing earlier on in the year. I gave you an interval. And I said, if you pick two points, any two points in the interval, and if the relationship between the function values you know, satisfies an inequality, then you know for any point in this interval, the function is increasing. Today, we do away with that. We just say, take its derivative. If that derivative at that point is positive, then the function's increasing there. Really nice and handy. On the, in the opposite direction, if the derivative is negative, less than zero, then f of x is decreasing. Okay, and for each of these, I guess I should point out this is at x. be pretty clear. The next step is to say if we have an interval A to B, if we have one of these situations for any number in that interval, function is, is increasing on that entire interval. There's no need to make comparisons. If we can, inside an interval, if for every single number inside that interval, except the endpoints where it's possibly not differentiable, if we have f prime is positive, then f is increasing. now on the entire interval. And in the other direction, if we have a negative derivative for any number in that interval, then f of x is decreasing on the whole interval. And that makes sense, I think. The first derivative tells us slope. So if I take an interval, a to b, and I look at my function value at some place in it, at x, and I say, hey, the derivative right here is a positive number, so that means the tangent line is going like this, then that means right there, the original function is going to be going up and to the right. The next little piece over here is going to be a little higher up. Right? If we've got a positive derivative, that means the tangent line of our function looks like this, which means the function, if I go a little over, is going to be a little higher up. 
So if all along, at every point I pick in here, if at any point I pick in here, my tangent line is always going up and to the right. That means my function is always increasing up and up and up. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. Very good. jump into a, an example. I want you to try and take this derivative by yourself. I think that's a, a good practice here. I'm going to try and find all find all the intervals where f of x is increasing or decreasing. is 3x to the 4 minus 4x cubed minus 12x plus 5. First thing we're going to do here is we are going to take derivatives. Oops, that's what I want you to try and do right away. Can you find that derivative for me? First step would be to recognize what kind of function we're dealing with here. This is polynomial. The second step is then to remember that we can take derivatives of differences, so this difference, this difference, or sums, this sum. By just taking the sums of derivatives, that means we can differentiate this, and then subtract the derivative of this, and then subtract the derivative of this, and then add the derivative of this. And then we see that we've got power functions in each of these, which means we can apply the power rule. So we take 4 times 3x to the 4 minus 1, multiply by power reduced by 1, which gives us 12x to the 3rd. And we do that for every single term because they're all power functions. x to the 3rd, so this is minus 3 times 4 times x to the 3 minus 1, 2. Same, minus 12 times 1, that's the power here, times x to the 1 minus 1. x to the 0 is 1, so we have this. And then plus 0, because the derivative of a constant without any variables at all is just 0. immediately terrified upon seeing that derivative because that's not nice to solve for zeros. The one that we got, so this is what they threw at us originally. I forgot a 2 minute. And this we can solve for zeros. I'm going to factor out an x as well. That makes this a 2. This a 1, and this a literally 1. Is everybody with me after that correction? Yes? Shouldn't the 
24 then, yes, thank you. And this should be two then. Yes, good catch, thank you so much. Yes, I think we've got it now. Anyone need more clarification on that? I forgot it too and needed to insert it later. We're good? Okay. Okay, wow. We can factor this a little bit further. This is a good exercise for you. x squared minus x minus 2. Can you factor that? If you remember, we looked at the factors of this number. We look at the factors of this number. And we ask ourselves, we've got a negative here, so one of these is negative. How can we add products of these guys together to get a minus one there? Well, it'd be minus two and positive one. Because negative two plus one is negative one. And we have a negative x there that we're shooting for. So f of x has critical points. Right? It has critical points whenever this guy is 0. And that's at x equals 0, negative 1, and 2. And we learned last time that wherever you have a critical point, you might have a max or a min. So let's see if our function Stop saying what I was going to say. Let's focus on the problem at hand. Let's see where our function is increasing or decreasing. At negative 1, at 0, and at 2, we know that our derivative is 0. So our function is not going up. It's not going down. It's, it's flattened out. So now we're going to check if our derivative is positive or negative along this number line. And I'm just going to label this number line with the signs of our derivative as we go along. This is very similar to checking where our function was positive or negative a long time ago. But now instead of looking at the function, we're going to look at the derivative to determine where our function is increasing or decreasing. So I'm making a number line with points which are critical marked out. We're going to check the intervals, signs, uh, we're going to check the signs at each interval of the derivative, to determine the solution to our question. Where is the function going up? Where is the function going down? These are the only places where our derivative is zero. It's not zero out here, or in here, or in here, or out there. So these are the only places where our function might stop increasing and start decreasing, or the other way around, right? So I'm making a number line with critical points marked out, and I'm going to check signs of the derivative in each. Here we go. Let's do some test points. Good test points are nice whole numbers. Let's try as a test minus 2. Let's try as a test of negative 1 half. How about 1 and how about 3? These will be our tests. Negative 2. 
go ahead and plug it into our original derivative. Not our original function. This doesn't tell us where it's going up or down. This is the one that tells us that. Okay, so that's a big thing to note here. You don't check your original function like we've done so many times before. We're looking at our derivative now. That's what tells us if it's going up or down. So the factored form is the nicest one to deal with when using test points uh, because you can just look at the signs of each factor. Original test point on the far left is minus 2. So we have a positive 12 times a negative 2. So we're at a negative so far. Times negative 4. So we've got a negative times a negative, which makes it positive now, times a negative, which is now again overall negative, 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 which overall is a negative product. So our derivative is negative over here. So our function from negative infinity up to negative 1 is decreasing. At negative 1, it stops decreasing. The derivative is 0. It flattens out. Let's test this interval now. Negative 1 half. Negative 1 half. Okay, so we got one negative times another negative. Negative 1 half minus 2 is still negative. Times, now a positive. So we have a negative times a negative times a positive, which means there our derivative is positive. And any other number I check in here is going to have the same pattern. Negative times negative times a positive. Because none of the numbers in here can change the sign of any one of those. So our function is definitely increasing from negative 1 to 0. Because the derivative is positive everywhere there. From 0 to 2, we're checking 1, which gives us positive, negative, positive. So it's decreasing in here. And at 3, positive, positive, positive. So if I had to like give you a really rough sketch of the function, at this point I could actually do it. A function comes down, levels off, goes up, levels off. Comes down, levels off, and goes back up. Roughly. I don't exactly know how high these, these troughs and, and crests are, but I know our function is coming down, stops coming down, and starts going back up, stops going up and starts coming back down, stops going down, and starts going back up. Okay, we remember what our polynomials look like, right? x to the fourth looks something like this, with maybe some wiggles in the middle. The derivative has told me there's wiggles. Okay, so it's a nice little tool for the derivative. So I'll write this down explicitly. We've got increasing and decreasing on these intervals. Increasing from negative 1 to 0. And from 2 and forever. Decreasing from negative forever, negative infinity, up to negative 1, together with 0 to 2. Questions on how I did that? Using the derivative to get that. Sorry, Jadella. So from this knowledge of increasing and decreasing, can you tell me if If f of 0, f of negative 1, and f of 2 are 
max or min? Local values, max or min? Absolutely. Right? Our function's coming down, and then it's going up. So whatever the function's value is here at negative 1, it's obviously a minimum. From here, we're going up, and then here, we're going down. So whatever value we have for our function at 0, it's got to be a maximum. Again, here, we're going down, and over here, we're going back up. So whatever the function's value is at 2, that's got to be a minimum. So f of 0 is max. F of negative 1 and f of 2 are mins. Local, at least. And then the question stands, are any of these global? The easiest one is, is f of 0 a global maximum? What do you think, Kevin? Global maximum. No. This point right here. No. No. Because over here our function goes up forever, and over here our function goes up forever. Okay. Okay. Next question, Al uh, Alvin. How would you find out which of these is a global min? <coughs> Sorry. The one with uh, no y value. Great. Yeah. You find the y value for each. So we've got at negative 1, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put an x-axis here. I don't know how high up this thing is, so I'm just going to put one here. It's our x-axis. At negative 1, we have a function value, f of negative 1, y value. And at 3, 2, sorry, we've got another min at some y value. Just compute these and check which you can do. And then my graph would either be right or wrong. <laughs> but once you check that, you can adjust. But like I said, kind of the point of today is let's get the qualitative shape of our graph and quantitatively check as, lo as little as possible. <laughs> so checking two points now would tell us exactly which one the global min is. But that's a lot better than checking lots of points, thousands. Okay. Okay. All of this is summarized in something called the first derivative test. This is something that is done so often. You're given a function, take its derivative, find all of this stuff. This is done so often that it, it is literally called the first derivative test, as in like the first derivative test, as in there's no other. This is it. If anyone ever says take the first derivative test or use the first derivative test, this is literally the only thing you should think of. So if you have a critical point, C, what does that mean? That means F prime at C equals zero or f prime does not exist there. We're going to stick with this for now. Suppose you have a critical point c such that f prime at c is 0. And f is continuous. Okay, we can't deal with functions that have big jumps in them or are missing points along them, we must have a continuous function. You can think about what we've talked about in the last few times. We've looked at 
Rolle's theorem and with that mean value theorem, all these sorts of examples. And if you remove that word continuous, strange things happen. Right? On a closed interval, there may not be a maximum or minimum if you don't have a continuous function. But if you have a continuous function, there's definitely a maximum or and a, or, and a minimum on a closed interval. If you have a continuous function, then between any two points, A and B, some interval, the mean value theorem says the derivative definitely takes a certain value, right? In particular, zero. So there's definitely some critical points between, in an interval, if your function starts and stops at the same height. But if you take away continuous, we can't say any of these things. It's kind of an important thing. So the first derivative says, suppose you've got a critical point some place where your derivative is zero and your function is continuous, then here's what you do. Case A, if f prime changes from positive to negative at C, then f of C is a local what? F prime changes from positive to negative at a critical point. And what is the function value at that point in terms of max and min? We change from positive negative, which means we're going up and then down, which means we have a maximum there. B, if f prime changes from negative to positive at C, then we have the opposite situation, which is an example here. Negative derivative, positive derivative. We must have a local min. And there's this case C. What if we have some strange function where the derivative doesn't actually change signs? If f prime does not change signs at c, then f at c is neither. A max or min. And it's not terribly difficult to come up with an example like that. So we just saw this applied to a different function. So we've seen cases A and B laid out. Let's apply the first derivative test. Two f of x equals x cubed. This test is an explicit list of instructions. First, find all critical points. starts off by saying, suppose you've got a critical point. So let's find them. So we take the derivative. That's a power function, so we multiply by the power and subtract one from the power. To find critical points, we set it equal to zero. Which means 
must be zero. Two times. Two critical points, technically the same number, but two of them. That's a zero of two for its multiplicity. But that's the only one. So we've got one. Which case does it satisfy? Well, let's check. Here's our number line. Here's our critical point. We've marked it out. Let's try a test point to the right. Try a test point to the left. How about we try one and negative one? Those are nice, easy points. We're going to check if the derivative is positive or negative at either. I plug in one to the derivative, and I get positive. So our function is coming up over here. Ooh, maybe it's a minimum. But I plug in negative one. I also get positive. So our function is still going up over here. So did our derivative change signs? No. C. Our derivative went from positive to positive. There's nothing in terms of an extreme value there. That's what that says. So my part C. Zero is neither a max or a min. Okay. What is it? In order to answer that question, we need to answer this more general question. If we have some function and we can differentiate it two times, what does that second derivative tell us about the original function? Um, does it tell us concavity? What does that word mean? Isn't it just the slope of the slope again? Well, that's what this tells us, slope and slope. But what does this word concavity mean? It has something to do with like concave up and concave down. So like which way like, almost the u's are facing, Ooh. if that makes sense. I know what you mean. Yes. Do you know what a concave shape is, everyone? Do you know what a convex shape is? Geometrically speaking, if I drew something like this, would you say that is concave or convex? Con convex. Convex shapes, convex things mean if I pick any two points inside here, any two points, so you have complete freedom, if you connect them with a the geodesic segment, that means a straight line on a plane, if that entire line is inside the shape, it's convex. Pick any two points any two at all, along the boundary or inside, if you connect them with this on a surface, straight line, if that entire line is inside, it's convex. Concave, on the other hand, means maybe a piece of that line is not. So I'll take roughly the same shape. And I'm just going to modify it by taking a chunk out. I play the same game of picking any two points. I connect them with a line. If that entire line is inside the shape, it's convex. This was a poor choice of points. Uh-oh. Part of that line is out. There is literally a cave. How many of you speak Spanish at all? Maybe a little? This is. High school Tony telling you how I remember this. You ready? What's this word mean in, in Spanish? Right, so concave means with cave. 
Yes, literally, that's what High School Tony remembered this as. All the way back in the early thousands, 2000s, I should say. Concave means with cave. Yeah, that's how you can remember. Concavity. So the second derivative you suggest tells us about the existence of caves, or rather directions of caves. Ooh, very good. So a curve can have caves, is the question. I mean, I just drew a curve, right? It's a closed curve, but it's a curve. If I asked you, here's a parabola, where is its cave? Concave up. Yeah, but where's the cave? Isn't it the entire thing? It's the top part, right? Like, is this the cave? Or is this the cave? No, it's like above. Yeah, this, this, this curve actually separates this part of the plane from this part of the plane. This part of the plane is convex, isn't it? I pick any two points up here, any two points. Connected. The entire line's in there. So which part of the plane has the cave? This part of the plane. Because I pick a point out here, I pick a point out here, connect them with a straight line, the dotted line goes through. That other part of the plane, oh, that's a concave shape. The entire surface is a concave shape. Yeah? So which direction does the cave point? Points up. This is what the second derivative tells us. If you give me a curve, and you find where it's positive, find where it's negative, it's literally telling you where parts of the curves are pointing up. In the, what I mean is the caves of the curves are pointing up. Where it's negative, it tells you where parts of the, cave, the curve, the caves of the curve, are pointing down. Here's a curve. It has kind of two caves. If I split it right here at this point, it looks like on the left I've got a cave and it's pointing down. But over here, on the right, it looks like it's pointing up. The second derivative is going to be negative over here. It's going to be zero here, and it's going to be positive over here. And that will inform us, actually, about max and min values. Here we're going to have a min because of this. Here we're going to have a max because of this. So that, we'll see an example here in just a minute. But that is the idea. What does f prime prime tell us? It tells us where a function's caves point, lots of quotes here, up or down. As I've drawn. I almost don't even want to like erase this because we have to reuse most of this, but uh, alas. So here is the definition of concave or a curve. So concave, or concavity, or convexity. This, I guess I could say it in numerous ways. Uh, your book uses mostly the word concave. So I'm going to call it this concavity of a function f. Okay. You can also phrase this in terms of convexity of the curve. But your book uses concavity mostly, so I'm going to use concavity. If the graph of f lies above all of its tangents on an interval, This 
this phrase might need to be described to. Let me give you a curve. Here's my interval from here to here. I'm going to draw in a bunch of tangent lines. Tangent line right here looks pretty flat. Notice how the curve goes above this line. Right? As the curve continues, it, it continues to go above this curve. If I then pick another point, in fact, any point, and I draw the tangent line, notice how if I go back a little bit, or if I go to the right a little bit, the curve keeps staying above the curve. But the tangent line, the curve is always above the tangent line. If the graph, the black one, of F lies above all of its tangent lines, the blue ones, that's what I'm saying here. So this, this is an example of where the function is always above its tangent lines on this entire interval. I take any point, just keep drawing tangent lines. I'm cheating that time. The graph remains above the tangent lines for every point on that interval. And what we're going to say is that this function is concave up on the interval. If I pick anything to the left of this, left of this point, and I draw tangent lines, the curve is actually below. But if I pick anything over here, and I draw tangent lines, my curve is always above those tangent lines. So over here we have concave up. Over here we have the opposite, concave down. So if I mix this up a little bit and say f lies below all of its tangent lines on the interval, then f is concave down. If I write that word and this word instead of above and up, we get the other one. This is a nice technical way of talking about the concavity of something instead of drawing pictures and playing the game of picking any two points. Now here's the relationship with the second derivative. And they don't name this right. They do. This is called the, apparently called the concavity test. If the second derivative at some number is positive. concave down interval. This is just a relationship between these tangent lines. Okay, so I said positive before.
high school. Tony's about to make a comeback here. How did I remember this back in the day? I always used to think that the second derivative is kind of the happiness function. Oh, I need more space than that. The happiness function tells you if a function is happy or not, and where it's happy and where it's not happy. This is obviously concave up, right? It's obviously also quite happy. Okay? Quite happy. Like the edges of its mouth just keep going. They don't, they don't stop. Like the nerviest smile you'll, you'll ever have. Either that or he's got a weird mustache. That's sort of like, anyway. This one, really, is not very happy at all. So sad, actually. The sides of its mouth never stop. They just keep going. So sad. The second derivative is the happiness function. When you think about the original function, the second derivative of it tells you where it's happy and where it's not. If you have a positive outlook in a certain interval, then you're happy on that interval. You look like that on that interval. On some interval, if, if your second derivative is negative, you have a negative outlook, and you're, you look like this on that interval. You've got a sort of a sad face going on. Okay? things that your book talks about. Points, not perms, points, where the second derivative is zero, tell us where concavity changes, or rather where it might change, just like with the first derivative. And a point See where concavity does change. It's called an inflection point. This point over here that I use in this graph, this is exactly where the second derivative changes from being negative to being positive. This point is called an inflection point. And I suggest this exactly comes from like a person's inflection with their voice. This is where the tone of their voice changes, the character of their voice. If I have a positive inflection on my voice, and then I suddenly start rebuking you, and I switch to a completely different tone in my voice, I've changed my inflection. So now, let's see how we can use these things. Questions about concavity? I've resorted to Spanish. I've resorted to happiness and sadness. I've literally resorted to how a person talks to try and explain this. So is it, are we good? I can give you more. I can give you as much as you want on this. Good? Okay. So here's a fun game. What if 
instead of giving you some rule for a function, I instead just told you rules for its derivatives. Could you recover the original from those? And how accurate might one be in that recovering process? This is a really fun game, I think. So that's literally the first kind of example that we have here. And we'll discuss some of the fallbacks, sorry, some of the possibilities that are not so great for us. Because this process of recovering does, it lacks something that we need, something that a derivative kills. Let me first give you this example. So our derivative of our unknown function is going to be positive on this interval and negative on this interval. Our function's second derivative is going to be positive on these intervals and negative on this interval. Can we how accurately can we recover the original function with just this information? So let's see where it leads us. The general process for recovering these things sometimes looks like this. Make a number line. And mark. the supposed critical points and supposed inflection points. So where are those in this problem? Someone tell me where a critical point probably is. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be an inflection point. Where the second derivative is zero, we call that an inflection point. So, Negative 2 appears to be 1 because it looks like the derivative is positive and then it becomes negative from to the left of 2 to the right of negative Sorry, to the left of negative 2 to the right of negative 2. Okay? So it looks like negative 2 is an inflection point. And it looks like 2 also is an inflection point. Critical point is where the first derivative is zero. First derivative is positive and then it's negative from this interval going to this interval. So at one, it looks like we've got a critical point. But we're making some assumptions here. This is the first problem that we run into. Is our function continuous at 1? How do you know? Because uh, we have this derivative 
We can't find the derivative. We know the left-hand derivative exists, and we know the right-hand derivative exists. But what about the derivative at 1? We might not know. We might not even have a continuous function at that point. I mean, I can easily give you a function that has those two properties up top, but it's not differentiable, and it's not continuous at that point. To the left of 1, we're going to use this. To the right of one, we're going to use this. To the right of one, we have a negative derivative. To the left of one, we have a positive derivative. But this is not a continuous function because it looks like this. Not even continuous, not even differentiable at one. Okay, so we're kind of assuming by saying that this is a critical point that we have a differentiable function at that point. That's something to tuck away and remember. Oh, is there anything else that can go wrong? Inflection points, right? Are they really? Is the second derivative really zero there? Well, if we have a nice continuous function, sure. Otherwise, no. Okay? So we kind of need to assume from the get go here. We're working with a continuous function, or we have to be given more information. Because there are strange functions we can cook up with these properties if we do not require continuity. Okay. The process of finding such a function to fit certain requirements, that's called analysis. That's what you call calculus after calculus 3. So, let's assume we've got a continuous function, or let's give ourselves more information. So I'm going to rewrite more information over here. Thankfully, I drew this kind of large. Information 3. This might be our saving grace, or not. Information 3 just tells us asymptotic behavior. What do we call these values, negative 2 and 0? We call these, remember, look what's going on here, look what's going on here. What do we call these numbers? Hmm? So, okay, yes, that's very good. Yes. Specifically, infinite limits are called if they're constant, <laughs> horizontal, very good, asymptotes. Okay, this gives us information. So, as I said, when recovering an original function, there's kind of this process that we follow. We make a number line and mark critical and inflection points, but we have to kind of assume here that that's what we've got. Okay? Or later we can discuss the possibilities of other functions. Second, what we're going to do is we're going to label intervals with models. 
Now what I mean by models are either lines for derivatives, first derivatives, or parabolas with second derivatives. So I'm going to do these things in the color coding scheme I've got here. Green for first derivative information, blue for second derivative information. The models for first derivatives are lines. We know on this interval from here to here that our derivative is positive. So my model is going to be something like this. Just a line going up. It goes up all the way until we hit 1. Then our function comes down because the derivative is negative from here on. Next, inflection points, supposed inflection points. We're going to label these intervals with what our function roughly looks like. For second derivatives, we're going to use parabolas to give us our models. Positive parabolas are the ones that are happy. So on these two intervals, here and here, our graph is going to look something like this and something like this. And in between, from here to here, we have a negative second derivative, so we have a concave down portion. The next thing is resolve conflicts because our models are just models, right? X squared is concave up, always, but that's just a model for what's going on in here. Is it always increasing? No. On the left hand side, it's decreasing, right? But our function from negative infinity to 1 is always increasing. So to resolve this conflict, we need to say, hey, this model suggests we cannot use the left-hand model here. So we need to take the left-hand side of this and erase it, because it has a negative derivative. So from negative infinity to negative 2, our function has to look something like this. It's coming up. It can't ever, as the model would suggest, come down. How about from negative 2 to 2? Are there conflicts with coming up and then going down in the models? Actually, no. That looks pretty good. It looks like our function needs to always be coming up, and it does for the first half of this model. And this, you know, once we hit 1, maybe we just shift this over a little bit. We need it to be coming down, and it does. So those models look pretty good. How about resolving here, these two models together? Well, from 2 on, we need to be concave up like this, but the right-hand side of that is going up, and our function is always coming down here, which is only the right side of that model. And this should suggest a pretty good curve right here. It looks like our function is going to start somewhere, come up like the right-hand side of a parabola. At negative 2, it's going to start leveling off. At 1, it's going to level off entirely. Right? At 1, we have a critical point. So it's going to flatten. And then it's going to start going down like the right-hand side of this. At 2, our function is going to change from being concave down to concave up while still decreasing. And what happens at the ends? We have horizontal asymptotes. How high up is this tail? And how high up is this tail? Well, the one on the left is at a height of negative 2. And the one on the right is at a height of 0. So if I put in here, some sort of marking for y-axis. This height here needs to be 0. And this one needs to be down here at negative 2. So perhaps I'll make this more marking. 
And that's a pretty good description based on what we have of the original function. But there's a possibility that it's not that. Because I don't know exactly how high up this critical point is. It could be really up high. It could be down lower. I don't know information about how big the slopes are exactly. Is it class time already? Yeah. Two minutes over. There's a lot to consider here, especially if we consider the discontinuity effect that we had before. Is it possible to still have a discontinuous graph and have these properties and that shape sort of? You have to consider that as well. Have a great day. I'll see you next time on Wednesday.